Hello again. Thanks for joining us on Space Nuts Q and A. Andrew Dunkley here, your host. Uh, great to have your company, and great to get a whole bunch of questions in from uh, various members of the audience who want to know about supernovae. Uh, that's a question that's come in from uh, David uh, and Peter. Is because um, Fred Fred's written books about telescopes or one in particular. Uh, Peter is uh, asking uh, Fred's opinion of 3D printed telescopes. That's a, a new thing. Uh, James wants to know about the Voyager space probe missions and Zane is, uh, he's come up with an interesting idea on how to do particle collision. That's all coming up on Space Nuts Q&A. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, Ignition sequence start. Space nuts. Five, four, three, two. One, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. And back again to answer all of those questions and probably a lot more is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hi, Fred. Hello, Andrew. Very good to see you looking hale and hearty. Yes, I wish. <laughs> um, no, we're going all right. We're going all right. Yeah. Uh, shall we get stuck straight into it? I think that's a good idea, yes. Let's do All that. right. Our first question uh, comes from David. Hey, Fred and Andrew. This is David from Sufleen, Texas. A uh, question about supernovas at recent hours. Whenever a supernova explodes, why doesn't it blow away the gravitational field and how does it stay intact to become a neutron star? Why doesn't it just get apart and then Turn into dust. Thanks. Mm. Uh, we we've had questions about uh, supernova before, um, and we we did actually refer to them in the last episode, the standard candle. Uh, why do they not blow away their gravitational field, and how does a neutron star develop as a consequence of a supernova? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, you know, we think of an explosion as blowing stuff away. Yeah. Uh, and um, gravity is a bit more robust than that, though. Uh, it's not something you can blow away. Uh, it's always associated with mass. And um, that's where really the answer to David's question comes in. Because um, what happens when a supernova explodes is it's, it's just the outer envelope of the star. So what you've got is a star which has got a, a core where all the action is taking place, exactly as our sun has. And then on top of that, you've got this mantle or envelope of hot gas um, where lots of things happen, magnetic fields do their thing and convection does its thing. Uh, when a supernova explodes, basically the energy of the explosion goes into that uh, envelope of, of material. So it does blow stuff away. Uh, and, uh, you know, David said, why doesn't it just blow, blow into dust? And in a sense, it does. Um, we find uh, all over the sky, and there's a beautiful new picture of one uh, at the moment uh, called the Vela supernova remnant. Um, we find these remnants of supernovae, which is the gas and dust that's been expelled by the explosion. There's a this new image from the dark energy camera has been released <clears throat> uh, uh, to show what the Vela supernova remnant looks like. If uh, if any of our listeners want to check it out, I think you're doing I it just, as we speak. I just did, yeah, wow. Isn't it spectacular? Uh, that, yeah. That's an amazing picture. Yeah, mm. just um, to add to that, um, one of the first pictures of that supernova remnant, certainly the first in colour, uh, was taken by my colleague David Merlin back in the uh, probably early 1980s because he was the man who worked out how you could uh, take true colour images of celestial objects and that was one of his first targets and it is very, very spectacular. The new image taken with a 1.3 gigapixel camera, I think, uh, shows a lot more detail. It's taken on a telescope uh, about the same size, actually, as the Anglo Australian telescope that David used, but on a on a better site. Uh, so there's yeah. some more detail in it. Very, very spectacular. That's not part of the story, but that's just to let you know and let David know that he can go off and find pictures of exactly what he said, all the dust being blown away. Uh, it's gas as well, uh, gas and, uh, and other stuff. But the bottom line is that gravity wins. Gravity overcomes uh, the, the outward force of an explosion and pulls the core of that star 
down to the size of a neutron star. So the gravity is all concentrated, if I can put it that way, at the middle, and it wins out. Uh, that's basically what causes the explosion, the fact that gravity wins out, the core collapses, and because of basically momentum considerations, when the core's collapsing, all this other stuff is being blown out into space. Uh, I used to do, uh, for schools, Andrew, um, uh, a demonstration with uh, a, a ping pong ball, which is very light, and one of those yeah. really solid rubber bouncy balls that bounces really well. And if you hold the two together and then drop them, uh, the bouncing ball transfers some of its momentum to the ping pong ball. The ping pong ball flies up, usually hits the ceiling, quite often hit me in the eye, which always went down well with schools. Occasionally <laughs> hit hit a teacher at the back of the of the hall. That went down well as well. Um, but but it's just that transfer of the momentum, the energy from one to another. That's so I used to say this is a the, the, the heavy rubber ball is an iron atom. The lightweight ping pong ball is a hydrogen atom. Put them together because they are together, drop them, what happens? The iron atom goes down, the ping pong ball goes up very quickly indeed. It's a good demonstration to do, actually. Um, and so that's that's what's happening. The, but yeah. the, but the bottom line is gravity always wins. And the only thing that stops the neutron star crushing, being crushed into a black hole is the outward pressure of the neutrons themselves. And that's the, uh, you know, that's that, that, that is enough to stop that gravitational pull. Okay. Um, just as a, a bit of a side note, um, you mentioned um, a 1.3 gigapixel camera. Uh, if you were to lay out a photograph uh, from a 1.3 gigapixel camera, it would be 80 by 30 inches. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I wanted uh, to know how big a photo would be if it was 1.3 yeah, gigapixels. That's big. That's two or meters giga, long. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, it's a pretty big photo, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I've seen them, uh, some of the big photographs uh, put to full size on a computer screen and you'll see, like, just a chunk of it. Yes. And you have it's to scroll, you can scroll right. and scroll right. just to get the whole photo. But, yeah. um, of course, you can cram them into the screen these days. But, um, yeah, they're, they're quite amazing. Uh, thanks for your question, David. We've got a text question now, Fred. This one comes from Peter. He said, I'm new to astronomy and just found a 3D printable telescope, the Hadley. I've not used a telescope before. Uh, what do you think about this project? Is it a good place to start? Named Peter or from Peter. Uh, I had a look quickly at the um, uh, website he sent us about printable um, uh, or printables.com is the website, but it also shows this printable uh, Hadley telescope. Did you have a chance to have a look at that, Fred? I did, yes. Uh, it's really interesting, actually. Uh, so what you're fabricating are the mechanical parts, uh, mm. and it actually looks pretty well done. Um, it's, you know, a, a modest-sized telescope, uh, 114 millimetres that they're talking about for the aperture. That's uh, getting on for five inches. That's, uh, that's a usable size, uh, and, and it's cheap. Um, there will be a lot of fiddling around uh, with because you've got to 3D print the components and there are a few components you've got to buy and certainly the optical components you can't 3D print, the eyepiece and the mirror uh, or the mirrors. Uh, so um, you, you can buy your screw and mirror kits uh, and you can then do the 3D printing uh, of the mechanical bits. To be honest, um, I think as a beginner... Uh, you might be better buying a cheap off-the-shelf telescope, uh, such as a Dobsonian, uh, which is the kind of telescope that sits, you know, on a on what we call um, uh, an altazimuth mount. It's just basically a box with with cutouts in it, uh, so the telescope can sit in it and and you can move it up and down. Uh, the the printable telescope is that kind of telescope, uh, but you're kind of starting from scratch and you might not really know what all these bits and pieces are for. Um, right. So my my estimate, if you're a rank beginner, would be to save up a little bit more and buy um, a small Dobsonian telescope, which are very readily available. Probably wouldn't cost you that much more than the 3D printed one either. Okay, there you are. I was going to um, suggest that maybe a 3D printable 
telescope would be a lot cheaper, but um, maybe not. But um, you know, five inch um, five inch mirror is pretty, uh, or lens is pretty. Uh, it's pretty decent in yeah. terms yeah. of um, a starting yes. point. Yeah, but it's bigger than mine. Four four and a half inches mm. is hundred forty millimeters. Yeah, yeah I um, yeah, right. I think the you know telescope making is an art in itself, and you're still doing that, but you just uh, you know rather than sawing bits of wood up and things of that sort and drilling holes in metal, you're actually three D <laughs> printing. Um, uh, so yeah, if you if you're into three D printing, give it a try. But um, yeah, my bet um, is you'll find it easier to get into astronomy by buying one. I, I'm not. Uh, I haven't tried any 3D printing. My son bought a 3D printer and used it for a while, and uh, I think he built his um, his son, my grandson, a, a racing car with it or something. But uh, it's it's extraordinary technology. But uh, it shouldn't surprise us that 3D printed telescopes are a thing. Uh, thanks, Peter. Lovely to hear from you. This is Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and being with a go. Space Nuts. Our next question comes from uh, an old friend, James. Mr. Dunkley, Professor Watson, it's James from Cincinnati, USA, and I've got questions relating to the Voyager mission. I recently read where Alan Cummings, who worked on the mission for five decades, said the spacecraft should last one billion years. My questions? What star systems are the spacecraft going to encounter and how close? Where might it end up after one billion years? Based on the size, I imagine it will be incredibly unlikely any ETs out there would detect either craft. If an alien version of Voyager came as close to our sun as either spacecraft are predicted to encounter in other star systems, would we be able to detect it? Mm, good question. Thanks, James. Lovely to hear from you. you know, James has been. I was wondering about James the other day. I haven't heard from him in a long time, but there he is. And I've still got my Cincinnati jersey. Thank you, James. Uh, I adore it. Uh, <laughs> Voyagers, yeah. Where, where will they be in a billion years if they survive? And there's every probability they will. Yeah, that's right. It's um, you know, I, I'd say it could be longer than a billion years. Um, mm. So I don't know the. You know the the exact number of of uh, objects or st solar systems that are on their uh, current trajectories. There are two of them, of course, the two Voyagers, Voyager One, the most distant human-made object. Uh, Voyager Two, not very far behind it, but in a different direction. Um, I don't think either of them are going to pass near any star systems. Uh, you know, within any kind of human lifetimes, uh, but um, because I think their, their velocities are in the region of 20 kilometres per second. Uh, and, well, you, you can divide a billion years by 20 kilometres per second to get how far they'll go. Uh, it's still within our galactic neighbourhood. Um, right. But I think the more interesting question that James raises is, uh, could they be spotted by... You know, uh, somebody on the planet, an extraterrestrial intelligence on a planet, as these things drift by, and the answer is yes, they could. Um, if they were near enough to the Earth, both the voyagers would be detectable from Earth if they were whizzing through our solar system. It would depend on the trajectory. If they were on the other side of the sun, we'd never see them; they'd be too small. Uh, you know, they're just a few meters in size. Um, but. Uh, they will shine by reflected sunlight, or in the case of the alien version, reflected starlight. Uh, and if you've got big enough telescopes and you're sufficiently adept at scrutinizing the sky, uh, you might well see them. Uh, and then you might do what we'd love to have done with the Muamua, the interstellar asteroid, chase after it with, with rockets or, or laser propelled sails with cameras on board. Um, just to find out what it was. So so that's, I, I guess, the ultimate fate of the, the Voyager spacecraft um, is maybe to be captured into orbit around another star, mm -hmm. maybe to collide, although a collision, because space is so big, a collision is actually a lot less likely. Uh, it's more likely that they might be captured and um, maybe even spiral in towards something 
down the track, which I guess will be a collision. Um, but we don't know. Uh, the, and that's what makes them, I find them completely intriguing, uh, these voyagers. And in fact, the other three spacecraft that are leaving the solar system, because they'll probably out, outlast our species uh, and, um, yes. and effectively go on forever. Uh, they've, you know, they will... They will keep going. They they won't keep operating. The nuclear batteries will die, but they will be still artifacts on a trajectory away from the solar system. Yes, Imagine and of course, um, one of them is carrying that uh, recording of the sounds of Earth. So, yep. um, the two voyages yeah. both have that. Yep. They both got that. Yeah, all right. Uh, I, I did plant. read one interesting... Oh, that's right, yeah. Uh, I did read one interesting theory is that uh, they could reach a star that doesn't exist yet uh, in one or two billion years. So there you go, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's food for thought. Mm. Yes, indeed. So there's uh, there's all sorts of possibilities. Uh, could they, you know, is it possible that one or both of them could be captured into a planetary orbit? Yes. I mean, we've captured a couple of you know, yeah. pseudo-moons, haven't we? Yeah, over, that, over the... that, that's right. That was the, one of the... Outcomes that I mentioned that the, and I probably didn't say it was kept being captured into an orbit, but that would be what would happen. And it's captured by the gravity, and it would remain in orbit. Maybe, as you say, forming a, a an artificial moon of a of a distant world around a distant planet. Mm. Wouldn't it be amazing if it just happened to stumble across an occupied planet? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they eventually achieved space travel and went up there and went, hang on a minute, <laughs> what, what's this? What is this? we were first. Yeah. 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 Uh, never say never. Uh, thank you, James. And our final question today comes from Zane. Hey, Space Nuts. This is Zane from Melbourne, Australia. I hope everyone is doing good. Been listening for ages. I love the show. Now, I've had this idea for years. Um, and it's on the topic of particle gliders, like the Large Hadron Glider, which, don't get me wrong, is an awesome piece of engineering. But I thought, how about we build these things in space? And from what I understand, the particles are guided along their journey by the electromagnets, and I'm guessing the bulk of what makes up these machines are those superconducting electromagnets and that would cost a lot to send up to orbit even once Starship was up and running but would we even need them? Couldn't we just shoot these particles off in opposite directions in the same orbit and wait for them to meet up? Um, and I guess the, uh, the speeds were far, like, far exceed the escape velocity of anything in our solar system so I suppose we'd need to do it around something really big um black hole or something might have to wait a long time but it's ideal it, it's an idea and i'd love to hear what uh fred and andrew you boys have to say about it. so uh have a good one thank you zane and uh thanks for being a long-term listener by the way uh particle colliders okay we've got um yeah we've got the large hadron collider on earth and I think they're building a bigger one, aren't they, Fred? Um, but taking it offshore, <laughs> yeah. Um, d you know, maybe using the planet as a particle collider, using the, the natural gravity effect. Um, I, I don't know how you would target something so minute in opposite directions to meet on the other side um, with precision. I, that, that's the that's the quandary I find in this question. Yeah, there's a number of issues. Um, uh, Zane's right, though, that uh, the Large Hadron Collider is it's, it's actually quite modest in its size. The the tube is about a meter across, um, which uh, is what is it, twenty seven kilometers, if I remember rightly, uh, around the perimeter of the of the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, so it's a meter that 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 contains the electromagnetics and cryogenic cooling liquid it's probably even liquid helium I can't remember what the coolant is uh, but but all that uh, those magnets are exactly as Zane said about precisely guiding particles along around the accelerator uh, so uh, that guiding has to be very very precise uh, and you're right in what you said uh, Andrew in that 
you know, the precision that you need to get two protons to collide uh, is pretty high considering how small they are. But the problem's bigger than that. And Zane's actually hit on it. Um, the uh, figure, it's quite a long time since I've been at the Large Hadron Collider, but I've been there several times. And in fact, went down into the, the bowels of it to one of the detectors, the compact muon solenoid, uh, where you see the ends of these tubes that, that do the acceleration. Um, the, the velocity is, uh, if I remember rightly, they're accelerated to 99.999998% of the speed of light. So they're traveling at the speed of light. So they're above the escape velocity of anything that you could think of putting at the middle with the exception of a black hole. As Zane said, uh, we know that black holes do focus the light around them. They, they actually, um, you know, the, the, the light travels around a black hole because of the gravitational distortion of space. Uh, but you're not trying to make particles collide around a black hole. Um, so maybe with a black hole, it could be done. You've still got the difficulty of getting one particle to hit another uh, by the end of it, uh, by the end of its orbit around the black hole. Uh, I think it's going to be much easier and much more cost effective and much more uh, realistic to keep doing things here on Earth with our standard particle colliders guided by electromagnetism. Indeed. Yeah, I, 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 I like his idea, and maybe one day they'll find a way of doing it off the planet. But uh, at this point in time, yeah probably beyond our capabilities and, and certainly beyond our bank balance. Uh, 26.7 kilometres, the Large Hadron Collider. There you go. I said 27, so not bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, rounding up is always a good thing in astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> Unless it's the Hubble tension, Andrew. Yes, uh, yes. If you round those numbers, they both come out to 70, um, and uh, the Hubble tension disappears. So maybe you've hit, you've hit on the answer there. But what there, we were talking about is. last time uh, with mm. the Hubble tension, yes. Uh, thanks for your question, Zane. Uh, always good to hear from you. And a reminder, if you do have questions for us, please send them through via the website. We uh, always love to hear from you. It's a simple process of jumping on to spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io and just click on the AMA link uh, where you'll be able to uh, send us a text or audio question. Or you can click on that uh, funny little tab on the right-hand side, send us your questions. If you've got a smart device with a microphone, uh, that's all you need. And the only other thing we would require of you is your name. And if you want to tell us where you're from, that is nice as well. We do love to know where you're from. Uh, so, uh, yeah, send us your questions. We'll, uh, we'll try and answer them in our Q&A episodes every week. Fred, we're done for another, uh, another day. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Andrew, and I look forward to talking to you next time. Indeed. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, part of the team here at Space Nuts, and thanks to all those uh, people back in the studio that number one named Hugh uh, for helping out as, <laughs> as always. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company on this edition of Space Nuts. We'll catch you again on the next episode. Until then... Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.